Well, good morning, church. We're so excited to be here with you. Thank you, Pastor, for inviting us back. Um, we were here, I think, during COVID. Ugh. That was a fun time for us. Um, I'm glad we're through that, though. Um, so we are really excited to be back, though, but I just want to take a few minutes. For those of you that don't know who we are, we are Unique Kids Ministry. We started this ministry over seven years ago, and we have been doing this full time for just over seven years. We'll be heading into our eighth year here, December 1st. Seven years ago, God started stirring our heart. I was a youth pastor, right. and I had an amazing group of youth, and I was in charge of doing all the outreach at the church I was ministering at, and God started really just tugging on our hearts to take what we were doing on this level, but take it to this level. And how many of you know when God stretches you from like, like a grapefruit to a watermelon, there's some growing pains in that, right? Yeah. But it actually hasn't been too painful. It's been pretty great and amazing. We have been able to see and experience kids filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, where they've received their prayer language from heaven. We have seen and experienced kids healed and released from anxiety and the pressures that the world has put on them. We have been able to experience kids coming to know who God is and who he has called them to be. Right. Right. And so... I don't care how many times we see it at the altar, kids pouring out their hearts to God at the altar, it never gets old. Amen. It's so revitalizing to right. see right. a new soul come to understand who they are in Christ. And so this week, we are really looking forward to pouring and investing into your kids because they matter to God and they matter to us. So Absolutely. thank you for that opportunity. Right. Right. Thank you for blessing us with your kids and sharing them with us this week. We are really excited to just love on them, minister with them, and we pray that the way they come in this week is not the same as they leave. Right. So thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. I'm good. I'm good. So real, real quick, with this behind us, you can scan that with your phone. It'll take you to our Linktree page, which is a link to all of our social media Everything's all in one spot. It's super cool, super easy. And uh, also, again, if you wanted to give, you can do that. But you can also give through the church, which would be fantastic. Friends, this morning, I want to share this message with you. And it's really a message that God placed on my heart. And, uh, and I know that because whenever uh, Pastor Sarah asked us to speak, instantly God's like, do this. And I know that it's God because I had confirmation. See, Pastor Mariah, she's not just my wife, she's my co-heir in ministry. Yeah. So when God speaks to me, he's speaking to her. And when he speaks to her, he speaks to me, so we have confirmation. And instantly, she's like, you should totally do that message. I'm like, are you, but I don't know. I don't know. Listen, God was speaking it to both of us. Yeah. So friends, listen, this is not from my heart, but it is from God's heart this morning. Amen. If you have your Bible, you know, that paper thing that doesn't run on electricity, never needs recharged, never needs Wi-Fi, always works every time you pull it out. Pull it open to 2 Kings chapter 22. If you have your smart device, that's cool too. I'll give you a second to get there. And I'm going to read to you. A very short passage, but I believe that there is something so profound in this. Second Kings chapter 22. We're going to jump in right at verse 8. But the prelude to it is this. Josiah was eight years old whenever he took over as king of the nation. Wow. Eight years old. You know, I'm not eight years old anymore, but I remember whenever I was eight years old, growing up on my parents' farm, being the king of anything besides the top of the hay mound was it. You know, that was it. King of the mountain. That was as far as we really reached. But to be king of an entire nation at eight years old, that is a lot of responsibility. But as he goes through life, we get to this part right here. 2 Kings 22, verse 8. Hilkiah, the high priest, said to Shaphan, the court secretary, I found the book of the law in the Lord's temple. 
Think about that. He found it. That means it was lost. I hope you haven't lost your word today. Then Hilkiah gave the scroll to Shaphan, and he read it. Shaphan then went to the king and reported, Your officials have turned over the money collected at the temple, the Lord of the Lord, to the workers and supervisors at the temple. Shaphan also told the king, Hilkiah the priest has given me a scroll. So Shaphan read it to the king. When the king heard what was written in the book of the law, he tore his clothes in despair. If you guys would bow your head and close your eyes with me this morning. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you for your passion this morning. Lord, I pray that these words are yours and not mine. Holy Spirit, I pray that they pierce the heart and the soul of everyone who hears them. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. amen. What I want to talk to you about today is this. It's this word, extinction. Does anybody know? This? Okay, so let me back up a little bit. We're in children's ministry, um, and really it's God's ministry, and it's full participation. I know that freaks adults out a little bit. What that means is I'm going to need some feedback during the message. Not sure how Pastor Tim does it, but when we work with kids, sometimes they put their hand up because they're very polite kids. But we work in the streets. They just shout out answers. So if you got an answer, don't be embarrassed. Shout it out. I promise I won't be offended. In fact, if I don't hear it, I probably would be offended. So my question for you this morning, do you know what extinction means? Okay, give me an answer doesn't exist any longer. That's a great answer. That's a great answer. I wanted to be honest and I, and I wanted to be clear, so I googled what extinction means. And in the dictionary, it says this, the process of a particular thing ceasing to exist. The root word of extinction is extinct, which means exactly that. No longer in existence. No longer in existence. You know, I believe wholeheartedly we're, we're living in the last days. I don't say that flippantly. I mean that wholeheartedly because this next generation could quite possibly be the very last generation before Christ returns. And the truth is, the devil, see, we were at a, at a church camp one time, and I was explaining to the kids, the devil is not your friend. The devil, if I'm honest with you, he wants to kill steal, and destroy you in every way possible. He wants to make everything you have destroyed. He does not care about you. He doesn't care about your feelings. He will lie to you. He will do everything he can to crush you, to make you feel inferior, to absolutely ravage your whole sense of being. That's the truth of it. The truth of what God wants, though, God wants each of us to do something. He wants us to speak the truth to the next generation so that they will not be destroyed. That's what he wants out of us. That's his God-given purpose for us. The question is, are you doing it? Are you going to allow the next generation to become extinct? Or are you going to allow the next generation to live for Christ? Right? Right? That's what we all want. That is the desire of God's heart, not just our heart. We know this because in Luke chapter 18, and I love that. I'm just going to read it right from the word. If you're okay with that, great. If not, I'm sorry. You can be offended by God's word today. <laughs> Luke chapter 18. In verse 15, this should be a very familiar passage of Scripture, but sometimes we forget it. In this passage of Scripture, Jesus is sitting there, and this is what it says. One day, some parents brought their little children to Jesus so he could touch and bless them. But when the disciples saw this, 
They scolded the parents for bothering him. Listen, this is one of those times when Jesus gets indignant. What do I mean by indignant? If you don't know what indignant means, it's literally like Jesus is flipping tables right here. He was mad. He was furious. If this was a cartoon, you know, who, who, who likes like old school stuff, like Looney Tunes, you know, Tom and Jerry? When they get mad, the face turns beet red, their ears come out and steam goes, Pew! This is what's happening in Jesus right now. Because the disciples are turning away children. Jesus says, let the children come to me. Don't stop them. For the kingdom of God belongs to those who are like these children. The kingdom of God belongs to those who are like these children. I tell you the truth. Anyone who does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. Did you get that? Christ is not saying to be immature. He's not saying to act like a fool. What he is saying is you have to have faith like a child. See, this is one of the things we love about working with kids is kids, I'd like to say every kid, but most kids don't have baggage. If you talk with adult ministers, and Pastor Tim, I'm sure would be very honest with you, sometimes it's hard to minister to adults because they have baggage. You've got to get through the baggage to get to the truth. Kids, you just give them the truth, and they absorb it like a sponge. When you tell them you've seen a limb grow back on a body, they say, yes, that's awesome. When you tell them you've seen blind eyes open, hearing restored, they say, oh, can I get that? Whether they need it or not, they still want it because it's awesome. We serve an awesome God who wants to do awesome things for us. And let me tell you an awesome story. We were at a camp one time, and we were talking about healing and how God, God's desire is to heal us. So we're going to be talking about God's miracles this week. We don't shy away from the truth of Scripture. God still does miracles. Amen. At this camp, this little girl came up, and she was, she was wanting prayer. Make no mistake about it, we always separate boys and girls. We believe that there is a distinction between how... Boys think and girls think. And I'm a firm believer that boys shouldn't be praying over girls and girls should not be praying over boys. Unless they're siblings and there's parents around. Different story. So we make distinctions. I'm over on the side praying with the boys. Pastor Mario was on the other side praying with the girls. And as I'm praying, I felt the spirit say, look over at Mariah. So I don't. She looks at me, she's like, I knew it was serious. I knew it was serious. She needed a two. I said, okay, what's going on? And this little girl tells us she had an accident with her knee. And like a little kid, you know, she starts pulling up her pants because they wanted to show it. You know, okay, yeah, yeah, all right, all right, all right. Let's, let's not go too high. We're, we're still in church. She gets up past her knee. She's like, see, and you can see the scar that ran right over the knee. I've seen that kind of scar before because, you know, I, I, older people sometimes have knee trouble. She goes, every time I run, skip anything, my knee hurts really bad and I, and I can't do it. And I just want to run with my friends. And it breaks my heart. Because it breaks God's heart. It was breaking past from Mariah's heart because this little girl couldn't run with her friends, couldn't skip, couldn't do anything that put pressure on her knee because it just hurt so bad. So we were very clear with her. We said, listen, we're going to put our hands on your knee and we're going to pray for you. And Jesus is going to do a miracle. We believe that. And we started praying for her. 
in the name of Jesus. As we're praying, you could hear and you could feel things popping and snapping into place in her knee. After that service, we walked out of the building and we could see that little girl running through the parking lot as fast as she could. We serve a God of miracles. We serve a God that cares about children. Think about this. Jesus knows something that we don't. That should have been a bigger amen. Let's try that again. Jesus knows something we don't. Listen to this. I got a few questions. And I know for some of us, this is really going to take some brain power to really think back years ago. Think about what was going on in your life around six or seven years old. I know some of you, that's really stretching out the gray matter up there, but just try your best. The reason why we think it's so important that we minister to these young kids is this. By age six, children have already started to establish their belief in God by age six. We have friends in New York City. And in New York City, in the public library system, there's something that's absolutely horrific happening. I don't know how else to describe it. You know, my old nature has words for it, but my new nature can't use them. (laughs) There are demonic people that are going into public libraries and reading over young kids, ages six and seven. The devil knows the same thing you know now. That age bracket is so important to reach. That age bracket is so important to impact for the kingdom. Let's say ages 9 and 10. Can you think of what you were learning in school at age 9 or 10? I know that's a real stretch. We've asked kids this very question before. What's a topic in school that's made you question the Bible? In one of our services, as soon as I asked that question, this young boy, he was sitting right in the front row. I can remember right where he was at. He just belts out, math! (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Yes. He was 100% right. 100% right. Let's think about this math for real quick. There's a passage in scripture that uses five loaves and two fish. (laughs) Let's talk about God's math real quick. The Bible says with five loaves and two fish, 5,000 men were fed. Friends, if that doesn't blow your mind this morning, the passage also says the women and children too. And not just they all got a little bit. It says they ate as much as they possibly could. This is embarrassing, but I'll tell you, we've been to Chinese buffets before, and you eat so much food, you like, you know, you wish you wore your stretchy pants. That was that day. When they were done eating, they wished they would have wore their stretchy pants. They ate as much as they could on five loaves and two fish. Not just the men, the women and children. If you do simple math on that, let's say 5,000 husbands with 5,000 wives, that's 10,000. If each of those families only has two kids, that's 20,000 people on five loaves and two fish. I would challenge any mathematician to come up with that equation. Five plus two equals 20,000. I'll be honest with you, they probably had more than two kids. Probably had a lot more than two kids. But listen, at age nine and ten, children have already started to challenge their beliefs. And it's largely in part because of the schools and also what's happening in their personal lives. Mm -hmm. Friends, I can testify to this. We've had children at this age bracket coming into our services that are tormented by demons. There was a little girl in New York City. She was at the altar just weeping. She says, would you guys pray with me? And she was talking with Pastor Mariah. Would you pray with me? 
Because every night whenever I go to bed, there is a demon that flies around my room and I'm scared to go to sleep. Friends, the devil knows what you know now. And he's willing to do something about it. Are you? Let's say you're in your teens now, 12 and 13. We've asked teenagers this question before. And, also, and honestly, like teenagers often do, when you ask them a question publicly, they sit there and stare at you like a deer in headlights. And you're like, was that in my mind or did I actually ask the question? <laughs> Listen to this question. Do you believe the infallible word of God? You know, that the word of God is incapable of being wrong. It would be awesome if they all said yes. Quite often they stare blank because they really don't know if they believe it or not. This is the truth. By age 13, children have already established their world view. Is it a biblical worldview? What do I mean by a biblical worldview is this. When you believe the Bible is entirely true, then you allow it to help you make decisions in all aspects of your life. I might have stepped on some toes there because there's some of us here that may not think that way. It's not too late to change it, though. But this morning, adults, I, I don't like ostracizing people in the service. So adults, like I said, this is full participation service. I have questions for you. You can simply answer yes or you can answer no, whichever you're comfortable with. You may be comfortable, you know, you telling the person next to you or your wife later or whoever brought you here. But here we go. Do absolute moral truths exist? Yes. yes. Is absolute truth defined by the Bible? Yes. yes. Did Jesus Christ live a sinless life? Yes. Is God the all-powerful, an all-knowing creator of the universe. Yes. Does he still rule today? Yes. Is salvation a gift from God that cannot be earned? Yes. Is Satan real? Yes. Does a Christian have a responsibility to share his or her faith in Christ with other people? Yes. My last question for you is this. Is the Bible accurate in all of its teachings? Yes. yes. Friends, if you answered yes to all of those questions, I want you to know this hard truth. You represent 9% of American adults. That's true. That doesn't send shivers down your spine. Are you awake this morning? Mm -hmm. What you're doing here is not in vain. What you're doing this week is not in vain. You're literally doing the work of God. Don't water it down. Come on. Don't yeah. water it down. Oh, yeah. There's another story I want to tell you about. We literally just read this story as we were traveling. It's from an evangelist friend of ours. She, she's a wonderful woman of God. She goes into the, to the prisons. And I don't mean like, when I say prison, I don't mean like, county jail where people go in in the morning because they got a DUI, but they still get work release. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the hard prisons. She goes in there. She ministers the gospel message. And this, this story hit us very hard because it started to make us question, are we being 100% accurate in what we teach? Are we doing it in love? What I mean is, is this, in the story we were reading about, one of the ladies she ministered to gave her life to Christ. Praise the Lord for that. Yes, she got out of prison. She contacts her evangelist friend and, and tells her, you know, they have multiple conversations. And after a while, the conversations slow down. They get farther and farther apart. And the pastor where she, this, this young lady was going, 
contacts the evangelist and says, um, do, you, do you know what's going on with so-and-so? There's some things that have really made me, made me question and, and I'm concerned for her because we love her so much. We don't want, we don't want her to slip into hell. Our evangelist friend, she started to question if she was 100% honest when it came to salvation and sin. Because this young lady slipped back into a life of sin, of homosexuality. The Bible's very clear. Whether you like me saying it or not, the truth of Scripture, and if you just said Scripture is 100% true, the Bible says it's wrong. It's a sin. Right. Yes. And it's not spoken love. We, we, we literally, when we're not speaking truth in love, we're literally sending people to hell politely. Amen. And that was her point. It made us question, are we speaking the truth in love or are we sending kids to hell politely? Mm-hmm. Right? It's a hard truth to swallow. Because yeah. the truth is, you're responsible yeah. for everything that comes out of your mouth. Yeah. There's a story I want to tell you about. Because it's really, it's not too late. It's not too late to change. It's not too late to affect those around us. You guys know what an archaeologist is, right? You know, they go and they dig in the dirt. Usually you hear about them like over in Egypt and stuff. So these, uh, these archaeologists were digging near the pyramids. And as they were digging in the pyramids, they found this jar. And I, and I imagine it was really cool. It was probably clay. I'm sure it had all kinds of stuff on it because they said it was still sealed up, which is pretty impressive. Because you think about it, that was probably thousands and thousands of years ago. Archaeologists are inquisitive. They're literally like kids. Think about it. They play in the dirt and they want to know what's there. <laughs> they, they find this jar. They open the jar up and they find seeds. Seeds. Like atypical, inquisitive. Do the seeds still grow? I mean, they're thousands of years old. They were perfectly preserved. They took the seeds and they planted them in the ground. And I'm sure, you know, I'm sure they nurtured them. Before we start into Unique Kids ministry, Pastor Mariah has a love fascination with pumpkins. I don't mind it. I hate pumpkin slice. But I don't mind pumpkins. I like to carve them. I like to put cool pictures on them and stuff. But, you know, I'm uh, trying to be a good husband. I'm like, okay, fantastic. You like pumpkins. We're going to do this awesome thing. I had a friend who would grow huge pumpkins. I mean huge. I mean, like, we had to use a skid steer to pick them up. Like, (laughs) yeah, yeah. Like, his biggest one was 750 pounds. And so I'm telling about how, like, you know, we're growing all these little pumpkins, and he's like, I'll just give you some seeds. I'm like, really? He's like, yeah, don't worry about it. I'm like, but, but you sell these individual seeds for like 25 bucks a pop. He's like, eh, have some. He tossed me this little envelope with probably like $150 worth of seeds in them. I'm like, okay, awesome. So we planted just a couple seeds. We got one plant to grow. And as it was growing, he was telling us what we needed to do and how we needed to trim it and and all the things we needed to do to get it to to grow of one big pumpkin. So we started in the endeavor of growing this one pumpkin. I made this contraption with a five-gallon bucket, and we'd fill it up multiple times a day. I think we used, like, what, 20 gallons a day for this one plant? And uh, we ended up growing a pumpkin that weighed 250 pounds. It's the biggest pumpkin I've ever grown or partake in growing. It was incredible from one seed. You know, the Bible talks about seeds. In fact, the Bible talks about mustard seeds. Have some with me here this morning. Mustard seeds. They're small. The Bible describes them as the smallest 
seed in the garden. That's how it describes it. And uh, when they're planted, you know, when you plant things, you got to pat it down. you got to make sure that it's well taken care of and well nurtured. Kind of like the word of God. When we're willing to go and plant that seed, something amazing happens. Amazing happens in lives. The seeds start to grow. They begin to multiply. The more you plant, the more they grow. In fact, they can grow pretty big sometimes. You know, some people have that ability to, to continue to grow and continue to nurture. You know, some people have an amazing, amazing time. Just, um, I'm so sorry. Um, I really only put a couple of these in here. <laughs> You're gonna, you guys are going to have to forgive me. You know, but this is what I love about the Word of God. The more we're willing to go and do God's work, the more He is willing to go bless us. The question is, are you willing to go do the work of God? Are you willing to go plant seeds? Like that story I read earlier from Hilkiah and Shaphan, the scribe. They planted a seed into Josiah the king. The re responsibility falls on more than just your pastors. Amen. Let me say that again because I think only one person got it. The responsibility falls on more than just your pastors. Amen. In America, listen, this is not a dig on this church, so please don't take it that way. In America, the average church service runs for about 90 minutes to two hours a week. That's a grand total attendance of about four days' time in an entire year. Four days. 96 hours. Your average child will spend about 11 hours a week playing or practicing a sport. Yeah, exactly. Hear me. Hear me in this. Our son right now has mandatory soccer practices. Well, not right now. Right now they better be in church or they're going to get in trouble. <laughs> but they have mandatory soccer. That's why they're not with us. But they have been working hard for God all summer long. This is his reward to them. He gets to play soccer. Our daughter's at work this week. When I say work, listen, she works at a toy store. She literally plays games all day long. That's not a joke. God's rewarding her for her hard work and efforts. See, but if a kid spends 11.9 hours a week playing or practicing a sport, that comes to a grand total of 618 hours a year. But they only spend 96 hours in church. Listen, friends, there's a, there's a, this, is, this is true fact. We literally just watched the Olympics, and, and this number is even smaller for the Olympics. But there's only a whopping 0.0296% chance that they will become a professional athlete. Right. There's a 100% chance they will stand before Jesus. Mark 9, 42 says this. But if you cause one of these little ones who trust in me to fall into sin, it would be better for you to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone around your neck. When the disciples tried to stop children from getting to Jesus, Jesus got them. Are you making a big deal about not getting kids to Jesus? Friends, children are not the church of the future. They are the church of right now. Yeah. And if we don't go after the next generation right now, there will not be a future of the church because it will go extinct. It's not an if, it's, it's a guarantee. It will go extinct. 
There's a passage of scripture that runs Unique Kids Ministry. It's this, Psalm 78, 4. We will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about his power and his mighty wonders. Friends, are you going to let the church go extinct? Think about this. Where do you need to plant some seeds? Because, friends, Jesus didn't die on a cross so you could be a couch potato Christian. I'd like everybody to bow your head and close your eyes this morning. We're going to spend some time talking with God. Like I said, this is his heart. If you can't tell that from that passage in Luke... You need to spend some more time in it. Jesus cares about kids. He cares about the future of his church. Am I playing some background music? Maybe you need to be like Hilkiah and Shaphan. Share the truth the Bible with children. Maybe your grandchildren. Maybe it's nieces, nephews. Maybe it's your very own children. Friends, maybe you need to be like the Shunem woman. You need to make room in your heart for those kids. Instead of when you hear their voices, you cringe. Make room in your heart when you hear their voices. You get joy in the future of God's church. Maybe maybe you're the next Lydia. And you're going to give so the gospel can go out to reach this next generation. Maybe God's asking you to be like Philip. Go share the good news wherever he sends you. Hint, hint. The Spirit just spoke that today. He's preparing a way for you. And He's going to protect you as you go. Maybe you need to be like Timothy and be that shining light of hope right here where God has planted.